Welcome to another episode of Behind the Dreamers. I'm Jennifer Loading, and we are talking to the achievers, the creators, the magic makers, and the dreamers. These are our friends, these are your friends, and they are living the extraordinary. Well, my friends, I am so excited about my guest today. And before I bring him on, of course, you know the routine. We got to welcome the sponsors, but I got, I got to give you a little snippet about this guest and how we met because I think this is such a cool story. So just real quick, I'm going to give you kind of the abbreviated package here. Back in September, my daughter was traveling with her boyfriend. They were going from here, from Dallas, where we live, to Colorado to see Alice in Chains in concert. And of course, when they got to the airport, they had to get a driver to get them to their next destination. And that driver happened to be my guest who is on today. But his story goes beyond that because when I connected with my daughter and her boyfriend, you know, we picked them up in Denver and then we traveled to the next destination. My daughter's boyfriend was telling me about this cool, awesome driver that they had met and how they had heard this story about him and what he's doing, which I'm going to save. I'm going to save it for a minute so I can let you hear about his story. But long story short, the day that I heard the story, I had taken a screenshot of his of him. I found him online, taken a screenshot so that I would not forget to reach out to him. And so here we are today with him on our podcast. And so I am super excited for you guys to hear his story. Um, he's an incredible human being, and um, I think you're going to be touched and moved by this. But before we do that, I do need to do a shout out to our sponsors. So today's episode is brought to you by Walt Mills Photography. If you are a creator needing post-production, consultation, or promotion, Walt Mills is your guy. Whether it is short films, YouTube films, photography work, or a new headshot, he can help you find a solution to match your needs. To learn more about him, Go to photosbywalt.com. We also want to give a shout out to our friend, Chris Klo of Upbeat Media Productions. If you are in need of turnkey special event production, Klo is your go-to. You can learn more about him and his work at upbeatmediapro.com. All right. So let me guys, let's see. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest here, Ebenezer Norman. He is a Liberian philanthropist, humanitarian, public speaker, and the founder of an education nonprofit called A New Dimension for Hope, a 501c3 nonprofit. Their mission is to provide underserved communities with the education that arms them with the academic, social, and economic skills needed to break the cycle of poverty by building schools and teaching self-sustainable life skills. So I am super excited, Ebenezer, to get you on here today. I want, to, I want you to share your story. I think it's incredible. And so welcome to our show. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here today. You know? I'm, ex I'm excited. Awesome, awesome. Well, I think what we need to do because I, like I said, I, you know, I think that we people come into our lives for certain reasons, and I know you and I talked off of camera before we jumped on here, and I told you, I, you know, like I, I was like, I want to know your story. Tell me what you're doing, how this all came about, and I just remember you telling me about all of these people that you meet when you're driving, and here you are, you met somebody that you didn't even drive because you told some story to to some kids that happened to hear this, and they went home and shared it, and I got excited about your. story story. So I want you to just tell our audience, take us back through this a little bit and tell us, you know, what, how you got here. Tell us how this came about for you. Well, I, um, I, for the last six, seven years, you know, I have driven over 16,000 people. Uh, I meet about 50 people every single day and I get a chance to hear their stories and get, get a chance to tell my story. And I think that it was true the interaction with your your daughter and her fiance or boyfriend, that how I came across you. Um, but to go back in my life, you know how I started all of this. I grew up in a very small country um, called Liberia, and, and as a kid growing up, um, I used to I used to wonder why. I mean, why wasn't I born white? Why wasn't I born white? in Sweden, in North Dakota. Why did I show up in one of the poorest countries in the world? And as a kid growing up, I, um, I would ask my parents, like, where did I come from? And my mom and my dad would tell me the same thing over and over. They would tell me that my grandparents were born there, they were born there, and they born me there. But part of me always felt that there was something bigger going on. 
but I was too young to articulate how I felt. So because I couldn't express myself well, I concluded at the time that maybe there was a previous life. And maybe in that previous life, I was such a horrible human being. And maybe this spiritual being, God, made me black as a punishment and dropped me into a poor place. As a kid growing up, that was my logical conclusion. So that's the first part of my life. Do you, want, do you want me to keep going? Yes, I want you to tell the story because I think it, it's it's leading us to where we're going. <laughs> and so I um I, I managed to um as a kid growing up when I grew up, high school was not free. So as a kid, I had to sell to make sure I can pay my way to to high school. So I managed to graduate high school. I got a scholarship to come to the states. So when I moved here, I um my first four years in college. I um I was struggling trying to to find my place in this world because if life has no purpose, then what's the real meaning of life? Right? What's the real meaning of life? So I tried philosophy. And when I started going start doing some philosophical classes, I got real confused because I started asking more questions. And then I started I tried religion. Um and I remember walking into my world religion class. And one of my colleagues said to me, say, Ebenezer, did you know that if you were born in Saudi Arabia, most likely you you believe in Islam or you're Muslim? And I never thought about how the place we were born has a big impact on who we become, you know? And so I just started reading books. And I came across a woman called Susan B. Anthony. And I read her story, and I was very moved by the work she did with women rights and voting rights. And I came across another guy from India called Gandhi. I mean, he talked about how each of us should be the change we like to see. And there's, there's another guy from South Africa called Nelson Mandela. I mean, he spent over 25 years in prison and he would ask these penetrating questions like, what do you stand for? What do you stand for? And Jennifer, for the first time in my life, I started to see something I never thought about. Susan B. Anthony was white, Gandhi was Indian, Nelson Mandela was black. So they came in different colors. They spoke different languages, English, Swahili, and Hindu, different geographical locations, different gender. But each of them had one single thing in common. Each of them was willing to live their lives to make the world a better place. And I said, this is a very interesting concept because when I was growing up in my village, we lived in a bubble. It was me, my immediate family, and maybe three friends. You get older, you have kids, your kids marry, your bubble extends. But our bubble never extended beyond the place, the people we knew. It was always the people we knew, you know? And so if you just think about it, before I met your children, your daughter, I had no idea you even existed. I mean, there are 8 billion plus people in the world. I mean, there's a very similar chance I'm ever going to meet her and I meet you, right? And so that's part of my story, you know, that part where, I, where it all began, you know, my mindset. Yeah, yeah. So I think, and this is where I think the story gets really, really good because I think all of this, you know, I, I feel like in life, I mean, I guess some people never get to that place, but I think we all go through this period of in our life where we start asking questions like we really like we're trying to find what we're supposed to be doing here what our purpose is our calling and 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 what that looks like and i think this is what i think is so really neat about you is that this story how this all kind of began and how you took this and kind of molded this into this this nonprofit and what you're doing and so i want you to share with us a little bit tell us a little bit about this nonprofit and um and also, because I know you're, you're still driving and what you're doing with that, because I think this is the really incredible part that I think is, because I am like, when you told me that the day that I, you know, that I talked to you, I was like, wow, because, well, I'm just going to let you take it. You can talk about it. So tell us about this nonprofit. Start there first. So, um, so when I, when I figured out that, you know, that, you know, that these people came from different backgrounds and they spoke different languages, different races, that, you know, that. And I said to myself, maybe that's a bigger purpose of my life, you know? And I started to look deeper, and I started to look at Nelson Mandela, you know? 
And Nelson Mandela said something very um, powerful. He said that education is the most powerful tool you can use to change anyone. And so I said to myself, you know what? Um, growing up as a kid, uh, there are 257 million children around the world who do not have access to education, right? And I know this because I was one of them. So I wanted to uh, to start with education. And I I created my nonprofit. I um, applied for my nonprofit salaries. I got um I got um I got approved and I was super excited. And I started applying for grants. And I would apply for all these grants, you know. And at the end of the day, the Red Cross would pick up the grant, or Save the Children would get the grant, or Compassion International would get the grant, the big guys, right? And I'm just a little guy in this big pond, you know. And I said to myself, what am I gonna do? So I said, you know what? Let me start driving. Right, and when I first started driving, I have to tell you, Jennifer, I had a worse attitude. What well, what well, I would tell people that attitude reflects everything, and because sometimes if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Right, and I started driving. I drove for one or two years, and I built my first school. The first school I built it was about 102 children, and I was super excited because that first school um, story made the New York Times. It made the New York Times because a Nobel Peace Prize winner saw the story that this guy drove living in Uber and she was super excited and she spoke with my story. Well, prior to one, the one year anniversary for that school, it got demolished. The government broke it down. And I was very, very um, sad. I was in a really bad place because I said to myself, who will break down a free school built for some of the world's poorest children, right? And so I got to a, a dark place. It took me five months, and I am um, trying to figure out whether I should go back and keep building or just walk away and start doing something. And I remember the lives of Susan B. Anthony, you know, that, you know, that struggle to make sure that women um, can vote in this country. I remember the lives of Dr. Uh, Dr. King, who he, he said that, um, I've seen the promise there, you know. I, I might not get there, but I'm okay with that. I'm not worried about it, man. I'm not fair enough. You know? So these guys before me, they endure difficulties, you know. And I said to myself, one of my, the first school I built just got demolished. Am I going to give up? And I said, no, I'm not giving up, you know. So I went back, started driving, and I drove hours and hours and hours every day, minimum 12, 12 hours a day. And I was able to build a second school, but guess what? The second school I built was 10 times bigger than the first one, right? The first one, 100, 100 students, the second was able to take a thousand children, right? And you know, and, I, and then when I look back on my life, I started to realize that one, if I was born anywhere else, I wouldn't have been the same guy, right? That each of us is so special, right? And we're so unique. And I think our biggest problem is, Jennifer, I think we think that we assume that we know how our story ends. I mean, no one knows how the story ends, right? I mean, but I, I, I drive so many people. And the most common denominator I hear from these people I drive is that we all on this quest to be happy, right? But happiness is so subjective, right? Someone, someone might, might watch a football game or, a, or an NBA game tonight and get happy, but tomorrow the happiness goes away. So the question I ask should happiness be a one-day thing or should it be constant? I'm going to stop there and let you talk, you know. <laughs> this is so good. Like you you had so many points there that I just really want to touch upon because you talked about in the very beginning. Okay, so to our listeners, just so you know, to, to get this cleared up, he is doing Uber driving and then he takes portion. How much do you take, Ebenezer? You take a portion? I take 50% of what I earn. Okay, so 50%, you heard him talking about driving like 12 hours a day, 50% of his money he's using to pour back into his foundation to create these schools. This is what I think is so impressive because I've been on the other end, you know, sitting in the Uber car and I just, you know, I've heard stories about, you know, like these poor Uber drivers having to put up with these people, you know, in the car. And so to think that he does this, but you said something even Ebenezer at the beginning that I really, really love the attitude piece because, you know, I heard something recently that I thought, I mean, just thinking about the context of these words, you know, like when you say, how happy are you? How is your dating? How is your dating? How happy are you? 
it goes along the lines with the, what is your attitude on this, right? Because it changes the perspective of everything. But I think also to your point, it raises this other question of the serving piece that you can find whatever that is to do and you can make the best out of that situation. But in the at the end of the day, it's really about the serving. It's it's when we serve other others, I truly believe is when we find our happiness. When we find whatever that is. That's your thing. You know, whatever that piece is for us as human beings is that when we get to that, you know, that self-actualization, we start moving up that ladder of adult development and we come to a place that we realize it's not about us. It's not always about us. It's about how can we take our gifts, our, our passions, our strength, whatever that is, and help other people. So I think your story is just, I, I just think it's an incredible story. And I, and I want to say to you that one of my, one of my favorite quotes is from Dr. King. He said that uh, everyone cannot be famous, but each of us can be great because greatness is measured by service and we all can serve. I and I think that, I mean, I and I agree with you. I mean, I think that true happiness come when we're able to lift people up without expecting anything in return. I mean, I, I pick up a, a customer the other day and her husband requested a lift. Um, and so I pick her up and from a very affluent, affluent lit neighborhood. And I was driving and was talking and we got to her destination and she said, Ebenezer, just keep driving. Just keep driving. And her husband called me and said, everything okay? And I got the phone on speaker. I said, everything's okay. She said, honey, everything's okay. And we keep driving and lift called me and said, everything's okay? I said, everything's okay. Because most people, most people looking for something to hold on to, looking for something to hold on to, and and we place so much value on the wrong things. We place so much value on the wrong thing. I remember going to um, Liberia with an actress called Rosario Dawson, all right? And Rosario Dawson um, 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 came to Liberia to see me, and she talked to social media to talk about my, about my story. And instantly, instantly, I got thousands of followers. And I was saying to myself, you know, Rosario does, he does nothing. I drive left for 12 hours a day, seven days of the week, and no one thinks I'm real. But this actress that does nothing has to validate me that do something. That explained to you why so many people are depressed. Yeah, it makes me think about, because um, I've been working on this course and we've been talking about like some of these great players in sports, you know, the ones where they're the ones that are that are carrying the weight, but you really don't hear about them, right? You always hear about the main player in a sport, you know, a sports team or whatever, but you've got maybe somebody on the side or whatever that is carrying the weight of the team and they're really the foundation, right? Like they're what's making it happen. You just don't hear about them. And so um, that's what's coming to mind when you say that. But I think that is so true that, you know, about the great, I think we can all be great. You know, we, we have to determine what that is. And when you're talking about happiness, like I said, I, I agree with you. And, and I say that even in my own journey, because, you know, for when I went through my health crisis, I, I would say everything, really my journey started before that, but I feel like that was kind of the catalyst that propelled me to go forward and do like you were doing, start questioning my purpose and things in life. Like now I have this information. What do I do with this? Because I feel like there's some higher calling, something I should be doing. And I don't feel like I'm really tapping into that, you know? So we, I think we, we have to, if there's something, there's something there. And, and, and I, like you, when you talked about, you know, being a kid and having these questions, I feel like there are some of us that do that as kids. We have different questions. They may have been different than yours, but we have questions like, what are we doing here? Like, why are we living here? And it's really, when you think about it, even as an adult, it's interesting how you can look at how our paths cross and you can be like, okay, so here's this person that grew up in another part of the world. Like, what are the odds you would have ever met this particular person, right? Like, how does this happen? You know, but I, I believe firmly that there are no accidents. People come into your lives for certain reasons. They bring, they bring gifts and um, there's a reason they're there. So uh, I, I love your story. Like I said, I just think it's so funny because I remember hearing this story from 
it was my, my daughter talked, but it was her boyfriend that told me that all of this. And I said, Oh my gosh, I need to talk to him. Like I need to get him on this podcast. And he's like, yeah, you do. He's an interesting guy. He's got a really cool story. And I remember screenshotting on my phone, your name so that I wouldn't forget when I got home, you know, and be like, you know, and I had it in my phone. <laughs> so I'm like, I got to find this person. So I just, I think what you're doing is awesome. And, um, yeah, there's so much to be said about this, about the simplicity of life and just going back to the basics of what are we doing here, you know, and how are we helping people? And what is this really all about? You know, when we get so wrapped up in all of our consumer goods and our, you know, our things that we have and, and are they really bringing true happiness to us or do they own us? Right. And, yeah. and really. And Jennifer, I mean, most of us just live in this bubble, right? This bubble just comprised of the people we know in our immediate family, right? And I tell people, expand your bubble. Why not expand your bubble? Because if each of us can use our passion to impact one person life, because we all have different passion, right? Yeah. Some people passion for education. Some people passion for gay rights, right? Whatever it is you're passionate about, use it. And don't, don't allow nothing to stop you, right? And it takes courage, you know, to make, to make a difference, right? But like me, right? I mean, nothing's going to stop me for educating children, right? Um, I used to drive for Lyft in Uber. Uber kicked me out uh, because of dogs, right? Because I have a situation with dogs, right? But I didn't live, right? If Lyft kicked me out, I'm going to do DoorDash, right? And DoorDash kicked me out, I'm going to do Uber Eats, right? The point I'm trying to make is that the people who change the world, they saw beyond themselves, right? You know, they had to remove themselves from the picture, and look at the impact it will make. I, I was reading about Susan B. Anthony. I think 20 years after she died, women got the right to vote. Imagine that. Imagine the difference we can make if we just push and see beyond our bubble, you know? Yeah. yeah. So good. I, it's so true. And you're right. Push beyond the bubble. That's great. And it is because we get so wrapped up in our own immediate little world and what's going on. And really the, the biggest ideas and change come when people come together collectively. And so it's funny. I feel like every episode I, I've recorded today, we've been talking about this, you know, networking. It's been the word that we all use because that's the collective American terminology here that we network, right? Because all great things happen when we start meeting other people, right? That's where ideas come together. And I always say in business, you know, if you're stuck and you feel like you don't know where you're going, you probably need to meet another person. Somebody's got the, somebody's got the idea you need to hear, <laughs> right? Like you were on my podcast. You were my next episode. There you go. See, <laughs> it's a great part about, that's a great part about uh, what we do and, and, you know, networking because you, you can always find uh, great people if you do a little digging out there. So, I love what you're doing. Um, where do you see this all going? Obviously, you said, you know, if you get kicked out of one spot, you're going to go somewhere else and do another. So I don't see you giving up anytime soon. But where do you see all this really going for it in the well, future? What, what I like to see, um, um, I like to see, um, I look, if I die and there is two million children um, getting access to education, I'll be very happy in my casket. Okay. Now, the one thing that um, you might not know is that I'm not only building schools by creating jobs. So I'll give you an example, the school in Liberia. There are 4,000 people in that village. There are about 1,500 women in that village. Um, last year, I, I, I launched a program to give women some loan so they can turn it into business, businesses in return helping to run the school. Right now, I have about six to five women. I created 65 jobs in this village, right? It's a level of optimism. And my goal here is to get at least 750 women jobs in this village. I believe that if I get 750 women in this village and they, and they can run their own business, they can now help me to run the school. They can pay the teachers. And I can move to the next place. I mean, I think the big picture goal here is that I want to touch as many as possible when it comes to villages. Because there are so many remote places in the world yeah. that the children don't go to school. They're kind of like invisible, right? And I was one of them, right? So my goal is to do two million children. Two wow. million children. And if I can do 500,000 women, right? Oh, I'll be so happy in my casket, man. I'll be very happy. <laughs> 
I could yeah, you are my, yes, and you are definitely. I can tell you're passionate. So I love that. I, I think that you know so much of what we do. You've got to have passion behind it. But it's like I said in a previous episode that I recorded today that people like passion, right? And I think what's so great about all of the people, and I may have shared this with you before, that I bring on the show that I try to find people that resonate, you know, with some part of my core value, what's important to me, whether that be serving or living a holistic lifestyle or whatever that means, right? So I try to find people that kind of resonate with how I live my life and how I do my business and how I think and stuff. And so that's what I love about this is when I hear stories like this, where people are, are doing things that they're passionate about, they feel strongly, you know, a, about that. And so, and I, and I think yours is just great because it's, it's the ultimate sacrifice really in a sense is that you're willing to do this to serve others what you're doing i mean that is your whole mission is to serve others so i, I just yeah i think it's awesome i think people are going to love this story so and i think it's what too happened in lives i really believe that yeah. with all my heart that that i mean i was very i was not a happy person sure um, growing grew, grew up in the village um you know but now i'm, I'm more happier because I'm, I'm able to lift these children up. And it's very intrinsic, you know. And I, I can't even describe the happiness because it's beyond description. I have to tell you that I, I I used to, I used to, when I pick up the first passenger, sometimes $3.50. And I would say to myself, hmm, when would I reach 500 which is my goal a day, right? But now I've changed my focus. My focus now is that I don't drive thinking about how much the, 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 it costs I drive focusing on the impact I'm making when I pick up one person, right? And it gives me courage to keep going and keep going because it's kind of, it's addictive, right? It's addictive because I can't wait to pick up the next passion you know, because I get a chance to hear their story, right? And I've learned so much with the 16,000 plus people I pick up, you know? And I have to tell you, Jennifer, I really believe that all the people I pick up, we all are on this quest to be happy. And I yeah. tell people, Find something you're passionate about, use that passion to impact the world, and you'll be happy. Yeah. Well, and and to your point about the the stories and stuff, because as human beings, we're we're wired to connect. Like that's what we do is connect. And I think that, you know, when you talk about this whole idea of picking these people up and hearing the stories, the thing that's coming to my mind right now from a business perspective is doing the unscalable, doing the things you don't get paid to do. You don't get paid to have a conversation. You get paid to take somebody from point A to point B. But here's the reality of the matter. You know that when your people have a great time, their experience is good, you're in conversation. This is filling, filling you up. It's filling them up. This stuff comes back. You know, I believe in karma. I think these things come back, you know. And so I really think that that when you can t remove yourself, like we've been saying over and over out through this whole episode is, you know, take yourself out of the equation and become more of how do I serve without expecting something in return? You're going to be the one that's happy in the end. You are going to be the one that becomes fulfilled when you stop looking for the, that ROI and that immediate what's in it for me and really get to, okay, now how can I make the person that I'm with right now, their situation better, or they can leave get out of my ride, right? Get out and be like, that was the best Uber or the Lyft driver, whatever. That was the best driver I ever had. Yeah, it's something that's very hard because, you know, we, we wire to want to take it ourselves. We mm -hmm. wire to want to take it ourselves and our family. And I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying that uh, if you're really going to, you know, make an impact and it, it takes courage, it takes commitment, but it also takes you removing yourself from the picture, because think about it, right? Whether we believe it or not, the only reason I'm able to be here is because somebody stood up. And right? because mm -hmm. that person stood up, a few other people stood up. People like Dr. King stood up for someone like me, right? I, I, have, I never met Dr. King, but years before he died, he struggled with the civil rights movement, right? So the question we should ask ourselves, like who are we standing for? Is this yeah. something that, you know, who are we really standing for? Like, you know, we can just live our lives and, and live in this bubble and 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 don't see beyond ourselves, you know. Um yeah. and reach reach down and, and pull somebody up. Because to me it's where true happiness in life. Yeah. Yeah, that's the message today, Ebenezer. Get out of the bubble. That's gonna be our motto. Get out of that bubble. 
So I want to ask you one more question. I think this has been great. And it's, I, I think it's just sometimes, you know, everybody's different when they come on this show and the stories are always different. But I just think this is one of those warm, fuzzy kind of stories. I like it. I think a lot of people are going to really resonate with this on some level. What have you learned about yourself in this process? I think that one of the things I learned about myself is that um, a some song can sometimes lead the wrong way, you know, um, because, you know, I pick up 16,000 people. Sometimes I prejudge them, right? Yeah. I prejudge how the conversation will go, you know, and and now I've come to a place where I don't assume anything. I don't assume anything, you know, because I think that sometimes when we assume things, we uh, we miss out. We miss out. And not only that, I think that we, we um, I think we just limit ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. And and I and I think my my favorite story is that um, I got pulled over downtown Denver, you know, um, as as a Lyft driver. I got pulled over, and the first car pulled me over, and the second car pulled me over, and the third car pulled me over. And I was sitting in my car, and I said to myself, "Huh, I might have done something wrong. How can I be respectful?" So the car comes to my window. He asked me for my driver license and insurance. I gave it to him. He uh, he goes to his car. He come back. He does not give me a ticket, but he warns me. He told me I was driving two blocks on the bus lane. So I was breaking the law, right? Now, when I said to him, well, I'm very sorry. I'm a Lyft driver, and sometimes I have to drive on the bus lane to pick a passenger. And he turned to me and he said, just because you're a lift driver, don't exempt you from the rules. And I said, oh, okay. So then I took it one step further. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, why did three cops pull me over? And he said to me, three cops didn't pull you over. He said, two of the cops you see over there, they just from training. They just from there killing me. Right? Now, Jennifer, think about that, right? Think about how that situation could turn into a George Floyd situation if I had formed something, right, or if I had a wrong attitude, right? right. So, I'm so it was our opener for me, right? That we can't assume that we know, right? Because sometimes when we assume that we know, we limit ourselves to know the full story. Yeah, that's so good. Thank you for that example. And you know what I think? It's so funny how we're talking about all these things about taking ourselves out of the bubble, not assuming, all these things that we're sort of kind of, I guess, I don't know what the word I'm trying to say, like projecting on other people. They really are the things that affect us, like, right? It, it affects our happiness. If we're serving other people, we're doing for others. We don't get returned. We're happy. If we assume for other people, it actually hurts us. It's yes. like the things that we're projecting onto the other people, they don't really hurt the other people. They hurt us or they make us better. And yes. so I think that the message here really is, is these two things about not assuming and, and serving other people. It's really about how do we... Treat, maybe treat people with respect. Maybe that's it, right? Treat people with respect. And I, I loved you. That was a great story. You hadn't told me that one, so I like that one. It's a good example. It's like, a, yeah. yeah <laughs> but we, thank we, you. We, yeah, we can assume anything, and we we just have to, the, each of us have to play our part. Yeah. You know, the war is not going to get better because we want the government, governments around the world right. um, to make the world better. I mean, government, I mean, politicians don't help. Politicians yeah. have never changed the world. The people who have changed the world have been all the other people that you and I are. So what, yeah. are we waiting for? what are we waiting for, you know? Yeah. What are we waiting for, yeah. So true. Well, you, my friend, are doing awesome things. And I'm glad that we got connected, even if it was a roundabout, that my kids were traveling to another state to go see an Alice in Chains concert. <laughs> I'm glad that we got connected. And I just want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because I think it's incredible. And I think that other people are going to hear this story and be like, Wow. I mean, just to, to be that committed. So what I do want to ask you that I, I think really quick before, and I would love to ask you a couple fun questions just so we can get off of a different subject, but I do want to ask you, where can our listeners learn a little bit more about your, your foundation? Well, if you Google Ebenezer Norman, um, just Google Ebenezer Norman, um, I will pop up and you see everything about what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm on okay. Instagram, I'm on Facebook, but Google is a good place for you. Okay. Ebenezer Norman. Um, you see Ebenezer Scrooge and you see Ebenezer Norman. <laughs> yeah, right. Find the right Ebenezer, right? We got to find the right one. That's good. We'll make sure too when we get this put together. I'll, I'll put some links in there so that the I'll try to find. I've looked you up, so I know that I know how to find you too. So you're not hard to find. I love that. So. 
Okay, so I want to ask you like just a few fun questions. We're going to like not be as serious, and this will be just kind of fun. Um, let me see. So, uh, have you been, have you been driving, have you been in Colorado the whole time? Is that where you've been driving the whole time? No, yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. What is your, this is kind of a funny question. See if you remember anything. What has been maybe your most craziest driving experience? So, so I pick up a guy, uh, but I got a request to pick up a guy. But before I pick it up, um, I got a call from his daughter and she said to me, my father is very weak. So when you go and pick him up, would you help him in the car? I said, okay. So I drove to a, a location in Colorado called Lafayette. So as I approached this guy, he sits in a wheelchair. So I got there and I got off my car. I pushed the wheelchair and together we were able to put him in the car. So I fold the wheelchair and I fold the wheelchair in my trunk. I come back in my driver's seat, and this old guy is smoking in my car. He's smoking, right? And I turned to him, and I said, oh, no, you can't smoke in my car. And he turned to me and said, yes, I can. So I pick up the phone. I call his daughter. I say, hey, the guy is smoking in my car. So she said, can you put the phone on speaker? So I put the phone on speaker. She said, dad, he can't smoke in his car. That's not, this is not 1960 yet, right? So he got, he got upset, he tossed his cigarette, but for the entire time to his destination, he was crushing on me, he was calling me names and everything, because he said I called his daughter on him. In a way, we got to his destination, and he turned to me and said, don't even try it, I don't need your help. I said, okay. So I got from my car, and I opened the trunk, I took the, uh, the switch here, and I pulled a rug to the door, and I came back and sat. And so for five minutes, he couldn't put his head in the car. So I called her back. I said, well, I'm trying to help your dad. And he, and he said, I, can't, I shouldn't help him. And she said, dad, you're just wasting this guy time, you know. He's trying to help you. What's going on here, you know. So he finally agreed for me to help him. And so I tried helping him. He was slapping my wrist. <laughs> he was slapping my wrist. And when I finally helped him, and I pushed him to where he was going. Uh, but it comes with a job, right? That's my craziest customer. That yeah. I've wow. You would, you would have definitely had to have patience to get through that for sure. Because you're like, what do I do with this person? Like, he doesn't want me to help him. He clearly needs help. He doesn't listen. Oh, my goodness. I can't. That's what I said. I can't imagine being on that side and, like, all the stories that you, you know, you compile over time with the people. And I'm assuming most people are okay. But then you always have to have that special one, you know, that. That's going to rock the boat. So I love that. Good story. All right. One more question I want to ask you because um, you've been here for a little bit. So what kind of, what's your favorite food? What do you love to eat here in the States? I think that, um, I think that I like a filo pasta. Ah, a fil very cool. A, am I seeing it right? A filo pasta? Yeah. I, uh, is it like you're talking about the, well, I heard pasta. So are you talking about like Alfredo? Is that what we're talking Alfredo. about? Like the cheesy, the cheesy? Okay. Yeah. Alfredo. Yeah. I thought that's what you were. I I thought that's what you were getting at. We got it. We got you. So that stuff is good. I'm not a big pasta eater just because I don't do a lot of carbs, but I do like a burrito pasta. So pretty good. All right, one. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to tell you my best story during Lyft. Your oh, your best story. Okay, tell us your best story real quick. We'll finish up with that. Tell us your best story. Okay, so my best story was um, about three months ago. I pick up a passenger from Denver International Airport. And I dropped there in the city called Luton, Colorado. Uh, when I dropped in, I saw, um, we were just talking, and I, and I saw where she was growing. It said Colorado Center for the Blind. Okay? Now, this one of the schools that I built, they are blind and deaf children in the village, right? And they've been wanting to go to school for two years, but there is no one trained in the village to help them. And so when I saw the Colorado Center for the Blind, my heart started to race. Long story short, I go in and I actually was in charge. They told me there was a woman called Julie. Um, she was the director of the center. So she was on the phone. So I waited for her. She came, she ushered me in her office. And I began to tell her my story. I said, I need help. I need to help blind children as well. And she said to me, Ebenezer, our school is not designed for, you know, for beginners. Our school is designed for people 
who already have the basic fundamental. She said, but leave your information here. And if there's a resource that come my way, I'll point it to yours to you. I said, okay. So I got back in my car. And Jennifer, two hours later, I get a call. And I was out of passenger in my car. And the call said public service. And I warned you, what is public service? So I asked ask the passenger, is it okay if I pick up this call? And she said, yeah. So I pick up the call. And guess what's on the phone? Julie. She said, Ebenezer. Ebenezer. I said, who's there? She says, this is Julie. I said, Julie from where? She said, Colorado Center from the Blind. She said, Ebenezer, we want to help you. And I said, what changed, Julie? What's changed? Long story short, um, well, two weeks ago, I had nine of my teachers that flew from Liberia and Ghana. They came to, the, to Colorado. They trained for two weeks, and they went back. And this Sunday, I'm addressing the War Blind Union, the War Blind Union, they may be the special guest speaker, and they want to partner with me to build blind deaf schools in Liberia and Ghana. That's my wow. favorite. Yeah. Congratulations. That is so awesome. Good for you. Yeah. Thank you. See, that's the power of meeting people. Yeah. <laughs> it's what it's all about. It's all about. Well, you are awesome, Ebenezer. Like I said, I love what you're doing. I'm excited to share this story. I think, you know, it, it's it's great that you're you're passionate about it and you love what you're doing. That's important. And um, you're doing a good cause. And so I just want to commend you for that and tell you to keep, keep doing it. Keep doing your thing. Thank you so much. So, and uh, we'll have to definitely, you know, we'll keep in touch and keep following you and see what's happening and what's unfolding on your end. So I'm excited about that. But um, to our audience, of course, you know, go check out it, check out his information, go Google him. You'll find him. We'll make sure when this, you know, that you have all the links you need. But um, of course, if you enjoy our show, please be sure you give us a rating both on iTunes and Facebook. We can't do this without you. And then hit that subscribe button on the YouTube. And we want to leave you with our always famous parting thought. In order to live the extraordinary, you have to start, and every start begins with a decision. You guys take care, be safe, and be kind to one another. We will see you next time.